Onward and upward. How's everyone doing on a Saturday? Our weekly Q&A session, 5 p.m. Mountain Time. It publishes every week. And here we go again in the newly redesigned studio, talking all about marathon training based on last week's question of the day. Let's dive right in. Steam Funk on YouTube asks, can you start marathon training too early? Steam Funk, my answer is yes. Now, with a caveat, I think Steam Funk Let's say your marathon is 18 weeks away or 16 weeks away. I think you could use the, so ideally you have at least, you want to have at least 12 weeks. You can, you can pull it off with eight to 10, but ideally you have at least 12 weeks for a marathon training block. And preferably I would say 14. A lot of the elite runners will bump up to 16 and that's based on they've proven that they can stay healthy and train at a high level for longer periods of time. But I'd say ideally you have at least 12 to 14 weeks to work with leading into a marathon. So if you, let's say you're 17 weeks out or 18 or 16, you could use, to, though, let's say you could use two weeks of that um, 18 week window to cross train, to stretch, to foam roll, to do plyometrics, to work on form drills, all these little things that will reap benefits down the road. So basically building up your, your strength in your ligaments, your tendons, your muscles, so that when your volume does get higher, you don't end up with an injury. And for me, and the reason I can say this answer to you, Steam Funk and everyone else, is that I had an injury in 2019 leading into the Cleveland Marathon because I believe I held my volume for too long at too high a level. It was an 18, it was like an 18 to 19 week training block and it was just, it was too long. Oh, I learned my lesson. So anyway, Steam Funk, I do believe you could hold marathon train, you can start marathon training too early. All right, moving on. Number two, hi Seth, running my first ever marathon here in Chicago in October. What preparation or workout should I be doing right now before going into marathon training? Thank you very much, and we love you. Darwin, love you right back. All right, great question, Darwin. Basically, what I just said to Steam Funk uh, is, I'm going to say it again. Lay that foundation of health. So making sure your, your running form is, is on point. Maybe go to a running shoe store and have them analyze if you trust them. Make sure it's somebody with experience, not just someone that was hired you know, a week ago at the running shoe store, but have them maybe look at your gait cycle. And I'm not saying you need to change your running form, but just make sure that your, your form is uh, not gonna lead to an injury, especially if it's your first marathon. So that would be one little tip right out of the gate. And then, um, Again, laying down that foundation of make sure your legs are happy, happy, happy before your volume starts to go up. So strength training. Um, I'm, and I, the reason I'm saying this over and over again is because everything I'm learning at the physical therapy office that I've been going to for the past three weeks because of this runner's knee, I've learned so much about tendons and overuse injuries, which is very common in marathon training and marathon uh, racing runners. Uh, so. Just laying that foundation is my recommendation, Darwin. Um, also, Darwin, if it's not until October, I would say definitely choose a race in June or July to peak for, so like a half marathon um, or even like a 10 miler. I would say a 10K maybe isn't long enough. A 10 miler or a half marathon, just to have a goal to shoot for it, because Chicago, that's a long ways away. Sometime in October, early October, and uh, you don't want to overthink Chicago for the next six months, okay? Have, so, have another goal to shoot for in the meantime. All right, good question from Darwin. Here we go. Jeffrey asks, do you have any tips or resources for someone hoping to run their first marathon? I've run a couple half marathons and regularly do 13-mile long runs, but the idea of 26.2 seems unreachable. Jeffrey, again, connecting back to Darwin, definitely break up your training so that you have a mini goal to shoot for in the next, you know, depending on how far away your first marathon is. Um, I would say also, Jeffrey, as far as a tip goes, become, become comfortable with the 20 mile long run. And I know 26.2 seems very, it seems far, but if you can slowly, and this is where that uh, training block, ideally if you have at least 12 weeks, but ideally 13 to 14 weeks, um, if you can, introduce the 20 mile long run throughout your training block, but don't go straight to 20, go to 13, and then go to 15, and then go to 17. So it's a, it's a slow incremental process to get up to that 20 mile long run. Um, and then as far as resources go, I mean, gosh, um, Jeffrey, 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 I mean, oh man, 
I would say, like, I do trust Jack Daniels uh, as far as his marathon training tips. So look up Jack Daniels on YouTube. He's a good, go he's a good go-to resource. And um, what else? Uh, gosh, Jeffrey, you're putting me on the spot. Uh, I'm trying to think of other. I mean, there's so many marathon training books out there. It gets a little overwhelming at times. So I'll just mention Jack Daniels for now. Jeffrey, that's uh, a couple thoughts for you. Moving on to Logan. During both of your marathons, how many miles in were you able to talk to the guys around you? Logan, I love this question. So he's asking, so in Amsterdam and New York City, how long was I able to talk to the guys around me? And it's a good indicator of the, the, the effort level. And um, was I going out too fast? Was I going out too slow? So Logan, I think it's a great question. As many of you know, went out a little too hot out of, in Amsterdam. So I would say in Amsterdam, I was unable to talk to people around me probably at like mile four or five, I would probably not be able to talk. But I will say, Logan, in New York City, like the gentleman next to me, we were talking up until mile, um, basically like mile eight or nine. So definitely further into the race. And, you know, New York City is quite a bit hillier. So that was interesting. So the pacing was a little better in New York. Uh, yeah, it was a little better. It was a little, um, it wasn't as even. Um, anyway, Logan, I love that question because it helps me think about lessons for the future for future marathons okay leaving it there moving on to number five here we go from sarah if you only have 15 to 20 minutes a day what strength training and or stretching exercises are most important to incorporate to supplement marathon training sarah i would say sarah 15 to 20 minutes is actually a pretty good amount of time um obviously like oh, stretching is so key you know oh gosh 15 to 20 but i would say sarah if you go to the prehab vlog that I made last week, the hip exercises, I just like, I'm so conscious now of runner's knee and overuse injuries because my left hip, it really was so much weaker than my right hip. So I would say ankle weight exercises to strengthen your, your hips and just make sure your hips are even. And they're, so you can go, you know, I don't know if you need to go to a physical therapist, but there's different strength tests that you can do just to make sure your hips are even uh, as far as strength goes. So that would be my, I guess my go-to answer. Also, Sarah, I'm a big fan of um, turnover and quick feet and making sure our legs are snappy. Um, and I'm trying to chase down fast time. So that's why I'm so concerned about, I wanna make sure like, even though I'm doing high volume, because what happens when you do long, slow runs, um, you're recruiting slow twitch muscle fibers as opposed to fast twitch muscle fibers. And the fast twitch muscle fibers, those are the, the fibers in our muscles that uh, sprinters have. But as marathon runners, if, I, if you wanna chase down your fastest times, your PRs, your, your BQs, I think we need to work, we need to continue to recruit our fast twitch muscle fibers. So in the gym, that's why you see me doing the, the quick feet exercises where you're standing in place and you're doing quick feet, the, uh, the butt kickers, the high knees, and some others that I'm gonna be introducing very soon into my regimen, getting ready for my spring 2020 marathon. So, okay, short answer, Sarah, ankle, ankle weights for hip strength, and then quick feet uh, exercises to make sure your turnover continues to press ahead. Oh, I think you can do it all in 20 minutes, I really do. Okay, moving on to question number six, here we go, and I did not write a name down for this one, apologize. Uh, this is, uh, it says, Coach Tom of Tin Man Elite has been training marathoners with no race pace workouts. Do you think this method of training can have benefits? So I don't know if that's, I, I don't follow the Tin Man Elite group as far as their everyday training. My guess is that this question that they are training faster than race pace, more so than right at race pace, I would think that they're not training slower than race pace. So my guess that, that I would say there, there can definitely be some benefits. Um, I guess though, I probably fall, it's all about walking the line and making sure you can stay healthy because that's the, that's the thing, if you're training at high volume and high intensity, so faster workouts than let's say marathon race pace, you just gotta walk the line and make sure you're not uh, leading into an injury, which as we know can happen with marathon training. Um, and I guess I would lean a little more in the direction of race pace for longer uh, stints. So that's why I love my threshold training. My, like my 13 mile threshold run that I did before Amsterdam gave me so much confidence going into Amsterdam and it was right at marathon race pace. So at altitude, okay? Um, so anyway, that's my, I don't follow Tin Man Elite 
And that's my short answer to that question. Oh, that's a big question. Okay, moving on. Uh, this is from Always Physio. How do you determine the speed of your tempo runs during marathon training? Uh, is it based on previous runs, previous trainings, or desired race speed? So uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, and the ease, my easy answer for you, Always Physio, is that for tempo runs, my go-to a reminder when I'm out there seeking out a little more up-tempo run, and this is different than a threshold run, okay? But a, a tempo run, I always ask myself, can I hold a conversation? If somebody was running with me, can I hold a conversation with that person? If I can, that means I'm going a little too slow, okay? Tempo pace for me is um, I can talk to someone, but it's difficult, and the sentences that I'm saying are really choppy, okay? Because it's hard to hold it. it, it sh tempo run should not be, uh, you should not be able to hold a conversation, okay? So that's my short answer, always physio, is it's difficult to talk if somebody was there with you, all right? Whereas threshold runs, there's like basically no talking. You're you're looking over, it's like you can say a couple words and then you basically gotta go silent for the next 30 seconds, okay? So that's my rule of thumb for tempo runs, always physio. Moving on here, Cameron. At what point would you use nutrition dur during a marathon? Um, he is training for a Milwaukee marathon on April 11th. So Cameron, I like to take uh, nutrition every uh, basically every 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how I'm feeling. So basically every like four to five miles, all right? Depending on your pace, of course, but I'd say at least every 20 to 30 minutes, a gel or depending on what your nutrition is at in at the aid stations, what options they are offering you at the aid stations. And usually, Cameron, there's aid stations these days, depending on the marathon, but there's there's a, there's a lot of aid stations out there. So some, and that's actually something I ran into in New York City. I think I did pretty well in New York City, but I may have, I may have drank a, just a little too much along the way. A little too, ah, uh, yeah, a little too much water along the way. Anyway, that's uh, a little lesson learned because I think in New York, if I remember, it was like every mile. I think it was every mile there was an aid station. Or was it every? It was a lot. So anyway, something to keep in mind, Cameron. But every. Um, and Cameron, I would say start taking your nutrition early, okay? Because it's going to catch up to you. Uh, the, the, the lactic acid, the burning through your, uh, your glycogen stores in your body. Um, so anyway, start taking your nutrition early. Don't wait until later in the race. Okay, moving on here. This is from OB9400. How many 20 plus milers should you do in a marathon training cycle? So I'm going to try and connect this answer to the broader audience rather than focusing on my um, training because I realize like everyone's got full-time jobs and families and like you can't go run 20 milers all the time. So um, I would say I recommend at least two, but preferably three or four 20 mile training runs leaning, leading into your marathon. So if you have a 12, 12 week training block, that means week seven, eight, and nine, yeah, seven, eight, and nine are your 20 mile training runs. And then 10, 11, and 12, you start the taper. I like the three week taper, some because, well, for me personally, because I'm coming off of such high volume, um, you might be able to do week 10 for another, uh, so that would be, I guess, is that number four? So seven, eight, nine, 10. So that'd be four 20 mile training runs. And then week 11 is the beginning of your taper. So then, uh, so seven, eight, nine, ten. So then six, five, four, three, two, one is that long, slow climb up to the 20. So it could be 18, 16, 14, 12, 10. So I'm just, I'm not a fan of getting up to your peak volume and holding it for too, too long. Okay. So I think three is, is good. Um, if you can pull off four and if your injury history is low, if you don't have a, a high rate of injury, then I think four is good too. Um, anyway, yeah. And can you pull off with two? Probably, but your marathon might hurt a little extra in that pain locker. Okay, good question. Moving on here. Do you increase mileage during training blocks or do you choose a peak mileage to cap out at while focusing on workouts like Jack Daniel prescribes? That's from Giovanni. Giovanni, I think I actually just kind of answered that based on the last question. So it's a slow rise up. And again, Giovanni, um, I don't know. I'm a big fan of not introducing speed work early in the training block. And I might be a little bit of an outlier here 
The reason I don't like to introduce speed work is because one, one because of my injury history, two, I, I per, and this is where you just have to get to know yourself so so well. I tend to peak. Uh, I tend to get in shape quick, like really quick. And um, if I hold my, it, I like to peak at the exact right time. So. I arrive at the starting line as fit as possible, as fresh as possible, and as healthy as possible. And I think that if the speed work happens too early in the training block, I tend to peak too early. And I know it because my workouts are actually too good and the workouts feel too easy. Whereas I want the, the race to feel too good and too easy, okay? So, oh, we could, get, we could go really deep into that, Giovanni, but uh, that's my answer is, slow volume up and start the speed work depending on how i'm feeling to start the speed work around let's say week five week six in the marathon training block whereas everything before that is just volume building that aerobic engine just like I, i'm always uh talking about good question from giovanni moving on shane how to use your training block for a specific marathon race pace uh, do you run your long runs at race pace or use the shorter runs for race pace and run longer, slower for aerobic building? I'm trying to figure out how to train for a specific pace and build engine as well. Yes, Shane, you don't run your long runs at race pace. Definitely not. Um, so Shane, you, you run your long runs. Um, if you want to put a percentage on it, I would say, or your heart, if you're a heart rate trainer, you could go that zone, zone two to zone three. Um, and then I'd say, Oh, it's like that 60 to 70% of your effort uh, effort level. Um, yeah, so no, you don't do your long runs at race pace. And then you use your shorter runs, like your tempo runs, your middle distance runs to increase the pace just a little bit. So, oh gosh, I wish I could give you some actual paces, but I don't know what times you're shooting for, Shane. So anyway, yeah, I'm, as I've already said, all about building that aerobic engine first. Moving on here to Moby Life. Um, what is the hardest part of marathon training? Any tips or tricks that helped you along the way? He's 21 years old. He's trying to, trying to run sub 245. I love this question. Like what's a hard part of marathon training? I would say, I would say Moby that, um, uh, I mean, Moby, the, the threshold running is hard because it's mimicking that race pace. And for me, I'm at elevation. So I... I, I like the hard, how hard it is at elevation because I know mentally when I go down to sea level, it should feel easier. And in fact, it has felt easier at uh, New York City and Amsterdam. So the threshold training is very difficult. Um, the long runs are not difficult for me, Moby, because I enjoy that. Um, and I would say, uh, Moby, of course, the, the, the interval training is, is very difficult for me. I just, uh, I don't love interval training but anyway that's my answer um hardest part about marathon training oh okay i'll just say i'll just say it stretching i i i when your legs are tired it's so hard for me to sit down for 20 to 30 minutes and just take care of the body when i'm tired when i want to sit in the recliner when i'm it's, so it's it's not the running part per se it's the it's the maintenance so that's probably that's probably my best answer for you moby okay moving on here i might have to skip a few because i know we're going long here uh let's see let me find the good ones uh they're all good but they're the best ones currently run about 20 miles a week and longest i've raced is a half uh he'd love to run a marathon this year when would you say is realistically the the soonest i could do it and also any other general advice about upping my mileage that's from lewis uh, currently running about 20 miles a week. So Lewis, I would actually say be very patient. It, you might need to wait a year because 20 miles a week, that's, uh, you know, as I already mentioned, I think 70 miles a week is a ideal number to shoot for. 60 at the minimum, if you want to really enjoy the marathon experience. If you can pull it off with 40 to 60, uh, that range, but the marathon is just going to be so much more painful uh, I just don't know if you're going to actually enjoy the experience. So I always say 70 miles a week as kind of that baseline. You, you, you'll, you'll arrive at the starting line. So therefore, Lewis, I would say you might want to put the marathon on hold for a little bit until you can get your volume up to at least 50 miles a week slowly. Okay, very slowly. Add like add 10 miles a month. So if you're at 20 miles a week right now, bump it up to 30 miles a week next month and then hold that for a month and then bump it up to 40 miles a week 
the next month. And if you can stay healthy and your body feels good, then work your way to 50 and then reevaluate. So anyway, I just say be a little more patient if you're only running 20 miles a week right now. Okay, here we go. Tyson asks, what gels do I use for marathon racing? The Morton gels, uh, the 160s, I believe they are. So the Morton gels spelled M-A-U-R-T-E-N. And I know it's a, the big hype in the marathon racing world right now, mostly because of Kipchoge, but I must say the technology in those Morton gels it's not even necessarily the the composition like the glycogen stores the what the fuel you're actually receiving to burn but it's how it sits in your stomach and expands and doesn't slosh around also i like the fact that it's not crazy high in sugar so anyway tyson there you go okay moving on interested in thoughts on sharpening in the later stages of marathon prep pre uh, race pace versus speed versus threshold or some combination thereof so he's interested in how to sharpen for a marathon. Um, let's see. So let's see. Oh, my goodness. Sharpening, sharpening. Okay. So I like the three-week taper. So, But I'm coming off of, let's say, 120 miles a week down to 90. And so I'm making a big drop down. Uh, so for you, maybe you're training 70 miles a week. And that's why I like that three-week taper rather than the two-week taper, which is typical for most marathon training plans. And when I drop down, um, that's when I begin to introduce a lot more speed, a lot more turnover. So instead of 1K repeats, I'll drop it down to 600 meter repeats and then 300 meter repeats. So if I'm three weeks out from the marathon, that's when I'll go from the 1Ks down to the 600s. And then the next week down to the 300 meter repeats with a 100 meter jog in between uh, on the track. And... Um, and at the same time, as I already mentioned, keeping up with the plyometrics, so that quick, explosive um, exercises, which I've made a vlog about, that help with basically the, um, the fast twitch muscle fibers in your legs to make sure your legs are not going dormant in the taper, which yes, oh man, all these vlogs are coming back to me. We've talked about that as well. I don't want my legs to fall asleep in the taper because they're so used to high volume, high intensity, and then I've seen it happen actually, even almost mentally as well with runners where during the taper, they feel like they're slacking a little bit and that they're, they're not getting that work in their legs and their legs can kind of feel sluggish in the last two to three weeks of the training block. So anyway, hope that answered it to a certain extent. I did not write a name down for that one. Okay, here we go. What is the minimum amount of recovery time between marathons? Marathons, that is from Colm. What is the minimum amount of recovery time between marathons? I think the minimum I learned, uh, you know, Amsterdam to New York was uh, was two weeks. So definitely not two weeks. I would say the minimum would be six to eight weeks at the minimum. But trust me, that is not recommended. That is not ideal. I would say you want to do two marathons per year if you want to be in it for the long haul. If you're pulling off three, four, five marathons a year, you're, you might be able to do that for a while, but I think it's over time it's going to add up and build up in your legs. And I just don't know if your marathon racing career will last as long if you're doing much more than two, you know, two to three marathons per year. So there you go, Colm. Okay, moving on. We're almost done here. Let's see. Um, if you only own the Asics Glide Ride and the Beacon V2 from New Balance, which would you race a marathon in? That's from Thomas. I'd go Glide Ride. I think even though it's a little, it's a lot heavier, but I, I think the Glide Ride, it's just got a little more, a little more pop. It's heavier, but it's got more pop. So I would go, I think I would go Glide Ride over the Beacon V2. The Beacon V2 is lighter and it's, it's nice, but if those, anyway, and those would not be my recommended marathon racing shoes. Okay, here we go. That was from Thomas. Here we go. From Joshua, tips for powering through miles 19 to 23, a.k.a. the wall. So that's a great question from Joshua. As many of you know, marathon racing, you hit the wall around mile 20, usually when your glycogen stores are being depleted very rapidly. And uh, you got to make sure your pacing is on point. And so Joshua, the, the I guess the, the quick answer, you know, we could get into mental strategies, but the quick answer is make sure you are in a group and you're working together. It's amazing, Joshua, the power of a group. So if you're, I often, you know, I don't see that too often where you're, you see these big city marathons and middle of the pack runners, back of the pack runners, they're running, but I never really see a pack, like 10 runners 
right packed together. Like, duh. Like, that's what I love about marathon racing versus ultra running. Ultra running, you're out on the trails and you're solo. That's part of the reason why I have transitioned from ultra running back to marathon racing. It is so fun to run at your race pace in a pack. It's so fun. So talk to people around you and say, hey, I'm going to go run 8.30 a mile for the next six miles. Who's with me? And like if you and just but like really pack up and I, you'll be amazed at how much that helps you. Not not to mention like the wind, like breaking the uh, the wind ahead of you, but um, just the synergy of running together. It's it's unbelievable what happens to you mentally as well. So that would be my tip for you, Joshua. So at mile 16, start talking to everyone around you and say, OK, everyone, let's do this. Let's pack up. Let's let's roll together. OK, here we go. Moving on. Last one from Alex. Do you ever do long runs that are further than the marathon distance so you know you are able to cover the distance and more? Alex. I would love to, but actually, I think in an I I think it's not rec- it's not recommended. Why? Mostly because of recovery. Um, you might feel good. It probably it will give you men- a mental edge, but at the end of the day, you just um, your recovery will be too long. You might you might need two weeks to recover, and that's two weeks in not like sitting on the couch recovery, but you might not be able to hit your workouts over the next two weeks at the at the level that you need to to make sure your speed is there. Um, so jo- uh, Alex, I just don't think, you really don't, really for the long run, I think 22 miles is awesome. Some elite runners will do 23 to 24 miles. Definitely, they never, I've never heard of the elites going 26 miles leading into a marathon training, so maybe some. I can think of maybe maybe like one or two, but it's very rare to go the full distance. So Alex, good question. And that is it, everyone. Marathon training. Again, there was over 170 comments last week, so I got to as many as possible. I love you all. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. Question of the day. Here we go. And this will be answered in next week's Q&A. What questions do you have for me all about racing shoes, specifically road racing shoes. We'll do another Q&A about trail racing at another time. Let's dial it in to road racing shoes for the 2020 racing season. That is a question of the day. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Tossing it back on the right to the Q&A playlist. If you missed some Q&As in the past, that'll be on the right. And on the left, we'll toss it back to last week's Q&A. Oh man, onward and upward to marathon racing in 2020. See beauty, work hard, and love each other. See you tomorrow.